Hello guys, TKN here and welcome back for your November JRPG News Roundup. So we are starting with the Falcon news and our first port of call is Pinbox. As for the Black Friday weekend, they had their own sale for a variety of items on their site. But most notably, they're coming up to their final stock for their 40th anniversary shirts. Upon the time of writing, most of the sizes are still available if you want one. In light of the 40th anniversary, it seems that they're also working on a commemorative pin as well to celebrate the occasion, though nothing else has been said from November the 9th as of yet. Moving on to Konparin now, who are a service exclusive to Japan. The basic gist is you go to a convenience store, they'll generally have a printer around the back and you can just purchase whatever prints you want. And around four months ago, the service was doing a crossover with the Trail series, meaning you could get a selection of images or bromides of your favourite characters. Even though I wasn't able to directly partake of this service myself, a very kind subscriber did so on my behalf, after I paid of course, sending me over a slew of my favourite images. Well it turns out that they've now added Kuro no Kiseki and the 40th anniversary pictures to their extensive list of choices too. So if you're able to get involved or have a friend who could do so for you, it might be worth checking out. In light of Kuro no Kiseki, there's also been some merchandise going up for the game on the likes of the Dengeki shop and the EEO store. Obviously you've got to be careful for the spoilers there, but if you've already played it, something to check out once again. Now moving on to Beep Shop, who had a pretty interesting item go up for sale. It's a compilation of some Falcon classics like Dragon Slayer, Romancia and Temple of the Sun on either a 3.5 or 5 inch floppy disk, designed for the X68000 home computer. Chances are many people in the current age don't have the means of playing it on their standard setup, so this is more for collection purposes than anything else. And what's cool is that they do ship internationally, though you will need to register for the privilege of doing so. For ease of service, I'd still recommend using a proxy. Finally, the long-awaited Altina figure released on the 25th of November, and some people have already received the item. Thanks to my friend in Japan, I know for a fact that my one is now in transit via airmail, so I'll probably have it in about a week or so. I'll share that in a video when it arrives, along with a general merch roundup for the past three months. Now on to the games themselves, and there's quite a few highlights to go over this month leading up to Falcom's shareholder meeting on the 16th of December. Thanks to my man Hanske for sorting us out here. We'll start with the latest progress on the Kuro no Kiseki spreadsheet via the Zero Field team. As of this point, they are in the text capturing phase for the finale, and they were in the editing phase for the side quests. So it seems like they're getting quite close now, and that was over three weeks prior, so they might have even made more notable progress since that update. Also, since we're referring to Kuro no Kiseki, Kondo has been getting involved in some interviews too. And one of the more notable bits of info came from his exchange with 4Gamer, where it was noted that completion of the series as of Kuro is at around the 65-70% to mark. The end of the Calvert arc will bring it to around 80%, and there will be more in regards to that a bit later on. Now in terms of Western releases, we do know of the official localizations of four Trails games that are due out in late 2022 to late 2023, but there was a notable leak from Nvidia GeForce Now showing a huge list of supposed releases. On that list were the four Trails games with potential release dates. However, since this is a leak, I wouldn't take this completely at face value as other titles on that list like the disastrous definitive GTA Trilogy were released on a slightly different date to what was stated here. However, it might give a rough idea as to when we can expect them on this platform at the very least. We'll also be diving a little bit more into this leak in our general JRPG news too. Back to Falcon for now though, and since we've mentioned the Western release of upcoming Trails titles, let's also have a look at the Clouded Leopard Entertainment versions for Asia, as they made a little bit of a faux pas on November the 29th by making their Steam version of Aldo Kiseki available for purchase. Upon realising their mistake, they implored eager would-be buyers to refrain from a purchase as the title was still in the debugging phase. This version is due out officially in early 2022. And rounding out our Falcon news for November, we're going to be getting an early glimpse as to what could be in store for us in this year's shareholder meeting. In Falcon's financial results up to September 2021, they also disclosed their plans for 2022. There will be a budget price version of East 9 for the 35th anniversary with additional products planned as well. 2022 will see Falcom develop Switch games in-house and they're going to be starting with Nayota no Kiseki. There is going to be a wider push for multi-platform game development. And finally, the newest game of the Trails series will be coming out in 2022. 
So yes, if this is anything to go by, 2022 we'll see the release of that Trails game to continue the Calvert arc, which apparently is moving away from the Arkride Solutions group who now have had their story told to us. Kondo said in a recent interview that they will have roles similar to other long-term characters within the series, so they will be appearing but they won't be as important in the grand scheme of the story. Now if I'm being honest, I do feel bad for the East fans as it is the 35th anniversary of the series and I personally was expecting a new East title. But Falcom did something similar with East 9 Monstrum Nox, releasing the game in 2019 which happened to be the 15th anniversary of Trails. It was only after that that Trails into Reverie was announced for 2020. But I do hope they have something a little more than just a budget price version of East 9, and Falcom have stated that there are some additional products lined up, so we'll just have to keep an eye out in December to get it given to us officially. Now we move on to the general JRPG news, and we'll start with this month's big release. Unless you've been living under a rock, you'll know that Shin Megami Tensei 5 was released on the 11th of November, with Famitsu giving it a review score of 36 out of 40, stating that the mainline story clocks in at around 50 hours, but you'll need approximately 100 to experience all of the routes on offer. Now, I haven't had a chance to play it, and I don't expect to have time to play it this year. It's going to have to go on my backlog for 2022. However, that might be a good thing, as in that aforementioned GeForce leak, it was stated that the source code of Shin Megami Tensei 5 shows potential multiple platform releases. As of now, the game is exclusively on the Switch, but based on the leak, it apparently will also be coming to PlayStation 4 and PC as well. And this information did come from the person who originally found that the SMT3 Nocturne remaster would eventually come to Steam, which of course it did. Again, take this with a grain of salt as this is not official by any means, but it's something to consider. As for Shin Megami Tensei 5 on release, it did pretty well. Physical units of the game clocked in at around 143,000 in its first week in Japan, meaning it was the third highest in the series behind Shin Megami Tensei 4 and Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne. In the UK, it even was able to outshine the likes of Tales of Arise by 23% and Bravely Default 2 by 60%. Though this was limited to physical sales, and really the JRPG market in the UK isn't as notable as in the likes of the US or Japan, but good signs nonetheless. And it seems that the unsurprising popularity of the title has also prompted its nomination as Best RPG at this year's Game Awards, along with Monster Hunter Rise, Scarlet Nexus, Tales of Arise, and I can't believe I'm saying this, Cyberpunk 2077, you know, that game that still can't even be played on older generation consoles? It wouldn't surprise me if it won the award either, knowing how these things go, but disregarding that, the four other nominees seem very worthy of their position here. Moving on now to another 2021 release that first came to Switch and PlayStation 4 on July the 27th. Neo The World Ends With You, the sequel to the 2007 3DS exclusive at that point in time, didn't appear to do as well as Shin Megami Tensei 5. In a results briefing for the six month period up to September the 30th, Square Enix stated that the actual sales for Neo were below their predictions, with the likes of Near Replicant, Life is Strange, and this collectively selling less than the Final Fantasy VII Remake in the same period last year, though I think it's a bit unfair to compare the games with arguably the most hyped title of 2020. Now on the surface, this could be seen as bad, and you can point to a multitude of reasons as to why it might have happened, like the lack of marketing in the West for the game. I personally don't remember ever seeing it in a Western Nintendo Direct, though apparently the push in Japan was far more focused with animated trailers and the like. You can also point to the fact it was already a niche title due to its limited availability on only the 3DS for the longest time, it was following on from a title that released nearly a decade and a half prior, or simply the fact that this fiscal report only included two days of the PC sales, as that's released on the 28th of September. I personally don't think this is as bad as it's made out to be, and in the long run I believe it's going to recover. Now on to Final Fantasy, and there's quite a bit to cover here. We'll start with Final Fantasy XIV, as it was noted that Endwalker, which was originally due out in late November, was delayed by two weeks for quality assurance purposes. It's now due an official launch on December the 7th, with early access starting on December the 3rd, so by the time this video comes out, it will be already in the early access phase. In other news though, there was the announcement of a manga series centred around some of our favourite members of the Scions, like Alphino, Alize, and Ishtola. 
It's a spin-off manga named Gakuen Eorzea, and it will be serialised on December the 24th, with its first official art shown back around the middle of November. Apparently, this will all be available on the Manga Up app, so chances are we in the West won't be able to read it through conventional means, but the internet generally finds a way. Moving away from the MMO now, and we'll start with Final Fantasy XV, which back in February of 2021 apparently had reached 9.5 million copies sold worldwide. It was interesting, it was never picked up until now, but it was apparently locked away in those Japanese mags until just recently. Obviously, take that how you want, I know Final Fantasy XV isn't exactly the most adored game within the franchise, but it now ranks as the fourth highest selling in the series history. As for an actual beloved classic in Final Fantasy IX though, that has been added to the PlayStation Now cloud gaming service as of November the 1st. Now the reason I bring up Final Fantasy IX last is because it segues pretty well into our next story. A team of 28 professional developers and artists joined forces and released a trailer simply called Welcome to Alexandria on November the 19th, as part of the so-called Final Fantasy IX Memoria project. This unfortunately is non-playable, but it's a reimagining of Final Fantasy IX with modern graphics, and the team hopes that one day it might even incentivize Square Enix to go ahead with their own official take. The project is not ending here, as they'll also be giving the same treatment to some notable cutscenes and battle sequences. But that is not all in regards to fan projects, as there was also some notable work done by Clyde Marto Mandolin, who may be familiar to those who have played Mother 3. One of the most popular ROM hacks of Final Fantasy VI from Japan has now been translated into English, and it is called Final Fantasy VI T. What this hack does is keep the original story, but adds content around it, such as side quests, costumes that affect base stats, along with bug fixes and rebalancing. I've attached a link to the Reddit post, which will give you the full rundown of the changes in this version. Now we move on to some minor tidbits from some other franchises, starting with Star Ocean, or in particular, Star Ocean The Divine Force that was announced last month. It got its first showcase of the environments that we'll be exploring on November the 5th. I'll link the YouTube video if you want to see that. Moving to the Rune Factory series now, and with Rune Factory 5 on the way, it seems that previous titles are also getting some attention, with Rune Factory 4 Special, the remaster of the original 3DS title from 2012, getting multi-platform digital releases on the likes of Steam, PlayStation 4 and Xbox One on December the 7th. A small tidbit for fans there. On to some visual novel goodness now with AI The Somnium Files Nirvana Initiative, which is due out in spring of 2022. It got its official box art shown for the first time on November the 24th, and it's worth noting as well that this is indeed up for pre-order, so if you're a fan of the original, you can check this one out too. If you pre-order the collector's edition, you'll also get yourself a 17cm tall figure of Iba from Good Smile Company, along with an art book and soundtrack. To Tales of now, and we're going back to the world of fan projects, this time with an update regarding Tales of Destiny. Noted as Lumina Destiny, it's a project aimed at providing an English patch for the duology of Tales of Destiny, originally released in 1997, which is also the second game within the series, and its 2002 sequel, as both of these games never received Western localizations. They aim to provide a translation on par with an official release, but also are adding quality of life improvements as well, and on the 20th of November, we received such an update where they showed their progress in regards to high-res skit images, including the process by which they achieved this. It's a heck of a lot of work, that's for certain. You can keep an eye on them via their Twitter page, I'll also provide a link to their website too in the description. On to Grand Blue Fantasy now, which has its own yearly festival running from December the 11th to the 12th, along with their special show known as Al no Kiseki Recursion and Reunion, which unfortunately has no link to the Trails title, there will be more information on the new action RPG Grand Blue Fantasy Relink, which is due out in 2022 for PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5. Apparently it will be coming to Japan first, but there was also mention of a Western release too, so this might be coming in the same year, but possibly a few months further down the line. One to keep an eye on though, if you're a fan of ARPGs. Okay, now on to one of my personal favourite developers in Gust. We'll start with Blue Reflection Second Light, which is due some post-launch updates for the 21st of December and the 14th of January. It also had one on the 23rd of November. There's not much to note here in terms of updates though, they mostly refer to a few tweaks to the in-game photo mode and the introduction of a higher difficulty. I played this game very recently and can vouch for how good it is, so it's definitely worth giving a go. 
And I'd say you could definitely start with it as well, you don't need to play the first game or watch the anime to enjoy the latest iteration. Though I can't deny that you will enjoy it even more if you have experienced the aforementioned two bits of media. As for Atelier Sophie 2, that's been getting a lot of love lately too. The game is due out on the 25th of February next year, and it got its first full official trailer on the 16th of November, showcasing weather changes, the reintroduction of the panel-based alchemy from the Mysterious Trilogy, and some notable changes to gathering with the introduction of major gathering spots. On top of that, each member of the cast has been getting their own character-specific trailers too, like Ramazel, Plakta, and Sophie herself. They've been releasing sporadically over the past couple of weeks. And finally, this was interesting, but it seems that Tales of Arise is also going to be doing a collab with Atelier Sophie too. I'm not sure what that will entail, but hey, why not? They did it with Sword Art Online, why can't they do the same with Atelier? Moving to the Neptunia series now, and it's apparently due a new title called Hyperdimension Neptunia Sisters vs Sisters, due out for PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 on April the 21st, 2022 in Japan and pre-orders have indeed gone up for both a standard and limited edition. It sounds like it will be more of the standard Neptunia formula in terms of gameplay, but with new characters and shiny graphics. There's also been some images from the Famitsu magazine in regards to the game, and a teaser trailer was shown off on November the 24th if you're interested. And now to undoubtedly one of the best games of 2020, which got some great news of its own. Vanillaware's latest work in 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim celebrated its two-year anniversary on the 28th of November with a commemorative livestream hosted by the Japanese voice actors of Hijiyama and Miwako. Obviously, this game originally released in Japan in 2019 and we only got it west a year later, hence the two-year anniversary if you're confused there. It was very much a celebratory stream as well, going over some of the actors' favourite scenes, lots of sweets on offer, but they also gave us a heads up on some future merchandise specific to the series. There were mentions of some goods from Arma Bianca, like a one-scale plush of Fluffy, the conniving cat, some miscellaneous items like mugs, flasks and bags, and a really cool hoodie in reference to Hijiyama's obsession with Yakisoba Pan. They go on sale on the 10th of December. There are also some long sleeve t-shirts featuring the artwork on the mugs with the likes of Natsuno, Megumi and Yori, along with their sentinel numbers via a collaboration with Spins, but from what I can see, these are only in one size called Free Size, which apparently is a one size fits all template, but I'm not too clued up on clothing. They are currently up for pre-order till late December though. And finally, in regards to the clothing, there was also a pretty cool looking second anniversary hoodie which will go up on the Atlas store, though I wasn't able to find where you can pre-order that one. But what really caught my eye was a 1 7th scale figure of Ryoko Shinonome from Furyu. Apparently it came about because of the popularity poll from the first anniversary and it looks like the majority have got their wish. It's still in the prototype phase but is quite close to finalisation. I will keep an eye out for the finished product for sure. Most notably though is that the game itself will be coming to Switch on the 12th of April, two days before Japan incidentally, and the physical and digital editions will also come with an art book. I'm interested to see how it will run on Switch, mostly in regards to the Sentinel SRPG gameplay, but this is great to hear overall. I played 13 Sentinels earlier this year and it is without doubt one of the best stories I have ever had presented to me in a video game format. And that is definitely a spoiler for the best games I have played in 2021. Keep an eye out for that one, this game is definitely going to be on it. On to Ryu Gagatoku Studios now, who many know are well known for the Yakuza and Lost Judgment games. In an interview with Famitsu on the 17th of November, it was stated the developers are already working on the tentatively named Yakuza 8, which will take place a few years after Like a Dragon, and will also have Ichiban as the main pro tag once again. They also say that they have some unannounced titles in the works that are separate from Yakuza and Lost Judgment, so it'll be interesting to see what they bring to the table. Jumping forward to Utawareru Mono now, and as part of the 20th anniversary livestream hosted by Aquaplus, which was actually done in advance of the real anniversary due on the 26th of April next year, they announced not only an anime series called Utawareru Mono The Two White Emperors due to start in July 2022, but also a new game called Monochrome Mobius Atonement in Time, which apparently is a prequel to the main series. That is due out in 2022 in Japan only, though the target platforms have yet to be announced, and there's no news of a Western release as of yet. And that's not really surprising, because we don't even have the latest game in the series in Zan 2 in the West yet either, so I think we'll be waiting for a while on this one. One thing's for certain, the gameplay does look interesting, and I can't wait to see what route the game takes in comparison to its contemporaries. 
Now some tidbits regarding some new IPs or at least very early stages of them. First of all, there's an indie game called Freds in Time, which apparently is a turn-based JRPG that draws influence from Chrono Trigger. It'll be developed with Unreal Engine 5 and will utilise 2.5D pixel art. There's not much more to say about this one though, as it's only in the Kickstarter phase. In other news, Spike Chunsoft and 2Kill Games announced a dark fantasy mystery title called Enigma Archives Rain Code, which is being worked on by alumni from the Danganronpa series. I think the art is a dead giveaway here at the very least. Again, this is in the very early stages, with no release date or platforms given. Finally, last month we found out that Shoji Meguro was leaving Atlas to pursue his love of indie game development, and he mentioned that he was currently working on a stealth gun RPG that he would announce in November. We finally know what it is now, it's called Guns on Darkness and is in development for PC, with no release date given as of yet, but we did get some early tidbits. Not really my type of game, but hey, it might tickle the interest of some fans of his work from his Atlas days. And last but not least, we're going to round out this video with some big rumours floating around, and there are two that I want to touch on. Initially, there was an article by Nintendo Life on the 6th of November which again harkened back to the NVIDIA GeForce leak. Along with a slew of other Final Fantasy titles, Final Fantasy Tactics was on that list, and it seemed like there was an online listing on the Epic Games Store for a remaster of the game due out in 2023. Again, not official by any means, but if we're going to hear anything, I'd imagine it will be sometime next year. What's more pressing though was another rumour regarding a big PlayStation 1 remake linked to composer Yasunori Mitsuda back in October, and we were due more information in December of this year. The links to the composer immediately drew minds to the likes of Xenogears or Chrono Cross, and this rumour has been gaining more steam lately as VGC relayed a tidbit from Xbox-era co-founder Nick Baker. Though it wasn't in regards to a Chrono Cross remake, it was a remaster, citing the NVIDIA GeForce leak from before. In addition, December the 4th will see a crossover between WFS and Square Enix for gacha title Another Eden, The Cats Beyond Time and Space. And it was noted that the game files held collaboration details for Chrono Cross. Coincidental to say the very least, but there's also that link with the main scenario writer behind Another Eden, who was also the writer for Chrono Cross back in 1999. Naturally, these are all assumptions at the moment, so take them with a grain of salt, but we'll surely know in December what we're due to get. And that is it guys, your JRPG news roundup for November is complete. With the festive season coming up, I might even do two videos for next month for the first half and second half of December, as it looks like we're gearing up for a busy period. Have a good one, peace.